I'm excited to get to teach the Word of God. Listen, if you have a Bible on you or an iPad or an iPhone, I want you to grab a hold of it right now. If you don't have a Bible app on your phone, I want to encourage you, you should download the Bible app or you version on your phone. Many, many different versions where you can interact with the Word of God wherever you are. But I, I kind of was, uh, I got born again in my, in my 20s, early 20s, and in a church that they used to always... Uh, hold up the Bible, and we would make a confession of our faith before we began to teach the Word. Did anybody ever go to a church like that where that was part of what you did every week? There's a few of you out there. And here's the reason the pastors would have us do that, is we believe that life and death are in the power of the tongue. Come on, somebody say life and death are in my tongue. And we believe if we'll get the Word of God in our mouth, instead of the Word of what this world is saying in our mouth, it'll begin to change what's happening in our life. So I want you to grab a hold of your iPhone or, or your neighbor's Bible if you have to steal it from them or whatever you have to do. And I want us to do that together as a crew this morning. So if you grab that iPhone, uh, hold it up or that Bible, hold it up. And I want you to say this out loud, all right? Do this with me. Somebody help me out up here. Let's say this. Say, this is my iPhone. No, no, no. Let's say, this is my Bible. All right? It is the Word of God. It's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I'll hide this Word in my heart that I might not sin against God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Today I hear, and my faith grows in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. I want you to open up your Bible if you have it on you, or, or open up that app, and let's go to the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16. If you're in the app, you could choose the New King James Version, what I'll be reading out of. Uh, the Gospel of St. Mark, the New Testament goes Matthew, Mark, and we'll go to the end of the Gospel of Mark to chapter 16, and these are verses 15 through 18, and uh, here's the way they read. They read like this. They'll have them on the screen behind me. Mark 16, 15 through 18, it says this. It's talking about Jesus. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, come on, everybody say, in my name. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Jesus starts talking to his apostles. He starts talking to his followers, those closest to him there, and he gives them a mission or a mandate and the mission and the mandate he gives them is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the truth that Jesus died for the sins of the world upon the cross. He said, I want you to take that truth and I want you to take it to every group of people, every ethnic group, every linguistic group, every person on the planet. I want them to hear the message that I love them, I'm for them, I want to save them. I'm not trying to push them down, I'm trying to pull them up out of their sin. How many of y'all believe that we as a church ought to be a church that's focused on taking the gospel through our city, out of our city, to our state, to our nation, and around the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Come on, somebody give God a hand clap if you think that's what the church ought to be doing. Amen? We've said for years that, that our goal was to win the lost and to grow the found. Save the lost and to grow the found. So we made this uh, declaration as the leadership of this church where we decided years and years ago that our first priority was to win the lost at any cost. So we're about saving people. How many of y'all remember what it was like before you knew the gospel of Jesus and before you had your sins forgiven? I remember being in a dark place. I remember my life next to destroyed, pretty much destroyed, and the gospel came in and changed me from the inside out, and he gave me a life. Come on, he gave me a new life. He changed me. He gave me a hope and a future and a purpose and a wife and a family and children and all of you in my life. Come on, God's been too good to all of us to, to not try to share his love to somebody else. Can I get an amen? So our, our first thing we really do is we're focused on preaching the gospel. Second thing we're focused on doing is we're focused on growing the found. I believe that all of us should grow as people. We should grow as believers. We should grow as Christians. Come on, we should become more like Jesus every year. I don't want to be the same Christian in 2020 that I was in 2018. 
I don't want to be the same guy in 2025 as I was in 2015. Can I get an amen out there? We want to get more like him. So we're, we're here to help you grow in life. Uh, to grow in family, grow in marriage, man, grow in discipleship. We want to see everybody grow. But I've seen people who were already found make decisions before to try to limit the church in who they could reach. Have you ever seen a group of believers become so about themselves that they forgot about the world that God had called them to? So we decided we'd make the decision. We're going to win the lost at any cost, and the lost come first at his church. We've been doing that for years. So here's what it says in the text. He said to them, go into all the world, go everywhere, and preach the gospel. The only way people can be saved is through the preaching of the gospel. Someone has to tell them the word of God for them to be born again. Had the opportunity. A guy came to one of our first services that is over outreach and church planning for a denomination over the, pretty much the whole Middle East. And he was talking to me uh, about this and talking about what it takes to win someone in the Middle East and in in the Muslim world. And he said the first thing it takes is it takes a a, a truth encounter. Come on, everybody say a truth encounter. That means people have to hear the gospel for their life to be changed. And, uh, you know, you'll hear modern Christians say things like this. They'll quote St. Francis of Assisi and they'll say, preach the gospel everywhere and when necessary, use words. All right, so that's been preached all over the world. People take it as fact. But there's no known written place where St. Francis of Assisi ever said those words. Because you cannot preach the gospel without using words. It's the preaching of the cross that's the power of God unto salvation. And you can live nice in front of people, you can be nice to people, you can love people, but if you don't ever love them enough to tell them the message of Jesus, you will never bring them into the kingdom of God. Come on, it's the preaching of the cross. It may look like foolishness to man, but it's the power of God unto salvation. Come on, that's where it's all at. So so he said first they they need a truth encounter, all right? Everybody say a truth encounter. Thought this was great, I'd never heard it said like this. Said one of the second things they'll need is they'll need a love encounter. Everybody say a love encounter. Somebody to love them that's a Christian. Somebody around them that that cares for them. And that's what they're saying, people are trying to say when they use that St. Francis quote. They're trying to say, well, if you just love people, they'll come to Jesus. Well, loving people is a part of bringing them to Jesus, but you also have to preach the gospel. Now, I'm not talking about preaching at them. I'm talking about telling them the message of the gospel, right? Right? Whenever we say preaching, Americans think uh, somebody's screaming at you and you listening. Kind of like what I'm doing right now, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about communicating. Turn to your neighbor and say, communicate to them. Just tell them that, right? So, so the second thing they need is they need someone to love them. Uh, I think about all the Christian people that loved me into the kingdom. Did anybody out there have like a, a praying grandmother that loved you and prayed for you? Whenever, whenever you were just, you were worthless as worthless could be. Can I get an amen out there? How many of y'all had a mom that prayed for you and harassed you to get you to church? My mother's out here right now. She used to harass me to get me to church, right? She'd ask me if I was coming to church, and then she would plant Christian literature all around my room, right? By my bed all the time and all that kind of thing. And I'm like, Mom, I'm not reading your books, right? And I'd get in there, and I'd get real sad coming down off meth or something. I'd read her book a little bit. But I'd never tell her that. I wasn't telling her that, right? Um, I, I'm just telling you, people loving you like that. Man, I had a sister-in-law that prayed for me back in the day and made such an impact in my life. I'm thankful for the people that love me. So the third encounter they talked about them needing in the Muslim world, right, because the Muslim world, their identity, uh, it's not just a religion. It's almost like they see it as almost like a race or this is what I am, right? You're born, they're, they're born Muslim, um, Christians aren't like that as much, born Christian. Well, you might be born into a Christian family, but if you come from a, a, a gospel-preaching family, they're going to tell you you're not born Christian. You must be born again to become Christian, right? Some of you come from some faith streams where you thought you were born in to relationship with God, but you cannot be born naturally into a relationship with God. You must make a decision for Jesus. You must be born by the Spirit or born from above. Or you're not a part of the kingdom of God. Right? A lot of people in Owensboro don't understand that. But I'm telling you, you must be born again. 
You cannot be baptized as an infant into the kingdom of God. You cannot be just brought in by a good Christian mama to the kingdom of God. It's not the way it works. You must be born again. You must receive Jesus for yourself. Come on, if y'all think that's good preaching, somebody give God a hand clap. I'm going to tell you, that's the gospel truth. All right? Always want people to know that in, in, our, in our culture here because a lot of people don't understand that. And the, uh, the, the third thing he said in that world because of this reality, he said it almost takes a power encounter for them to be born again. They need a power encounter. A lot of the people that have, I've seen uh, born again or talked to from the Middle East and from that world, they had some kind of power encounter where Jesus showed up in a dream, showed up in a vision, right? People were praying for him. There was some manifestation of God in some powerful sense that brought them to the gospel. Now, I'm telling you, God is a God that is powerful, and he's not just a creed. We don't just have a doctrine or a dogma. Come on, we have a living God. This last week, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus, and I'm going to tell you that Jesus is here this morning. He is alive. He is powerful. He has risen from the grave, and he's here to change and to move in your life. And there are still power encounters. God is alive. I've seen it for many, many years. Here's what, here's what the text says. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believeth not, is what the old King James Version said, will be damned. So it's our job as Christians to tell the story of Jesus everywhere we go. And I'm telling you, everybody you tell the story will not receive the story. And sometimes when they reject the story, they reject you. And uh, it feels that way. They're not just rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. you got to understand that, that those who believe will be born again. Those who won't will reject it. That's part of the thing. And he goes on and he says this. He says that I'm going to help you with carrying this message. As you carry this message, I'll help you. Next part of the text. He says, and these signs will follow them that believe. Talks about supernatural signs. Things will happen around people who are on the offense to preaching the gospel. Now, not just signs to entertain us, but miracles and signs and things will happen if we're working in kingdom purpose. I've heard a lot of people say, they'll say things like this in the West, in the Christian world. They'll say, well, people talk about miracles, but I've never seen a miracle in my life. I've never seen a miracle around what I was doing. And the question I always have for those people is, just how involved were you in reaching out to somebody else or advancing the gospel message? Because he said signs would follow those who are associated with preaching the gospel and bringing the message of Christ to other people. See, you won't get miracles unless you put yourself in a context for God to need to work a miracle on your behalf to advance his mission and his will. Does that make sense? doesn't just do them to entertain us, right? He does it for purpose sake. And he goes on and he says this, these signs will follow them who believe in my name. Come on, everybody say in my name. Say it one more time, in my name. In my name they will cast out demons or devils, some versions say. In my name they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. But the key to all of those things starts out with in my name. All right, it's in the name of Jesus these things are done. And he says they'll cast out devils. How many of y'all believe that there's such a thing as an angel? Do you believe there's such a thing as an angel? Come on, a angelic uh, intervention, we believe that. If you believe there's such a thing as angels in the Bible, you must also believe there's such a thing as the demonic because a third of the angels fell from the heavens. And now they assist Lucifer's reign in trying to still kill and destroy every human upon the earth. So he said, in my name, in the name of Jesus, you will cast out devils or remove demonic uh, influence, remove demonic oppression and possession from people's lives. There are devils out there. He goes on and he says, you'll, you'll speak with new tongues. There's new language you can get to pray in and to bring the word of the Lord from. He said, you, you'll have this in the name of Jesus. He goes on and he says this. He says, after that, he says these words. He says, uh, they'll take up serpents. Now, if the ushers would go ahead and bring the boxes with the rattlers to the front, we're going to get this meeting on this morning. We'll get this thing started. Look at your neighbor and say, he's just kidding. Tell him that, all right? We're in, we're in western Kentucky, not in eastern Kentucky. You're safe with me, all right? We only do that in our small groups. We don't do that. We don't do that in here. Uh, so after that, he says, uh, he, he says, you know, and really that, that, that serpent thing, serpent's a symbol of the demonic. Right, he says you'll take up serpents. And it's about removing demonic activity from an area. 
And uh, the devil has always been symbolized by the serpent. My boy asked me for a pet snake, and I'm like, there's no way we're ever bringing a snake into the house to sleep with us. Can I get an amen out there? The only good snake from my perspective is a dead snake. You know, you get these naturalists, you'll see somebody, will post a picture of a snake. They're like, oh, please don't kill it. It's a good snake. I'm like, if that snake comes close to me, that's a dead snake. I'm telling you what kind of snake that is. It's a dead snake. So he goes on and he says, you'll, you'll take up serpents. He says, if you drink anything deadly, it shall not harm you. Now, that's not if you do it on purpose, right? You moonshiners can't claim that verse, right? You drink the moonshine. If it kills you, it's on you. Can I get an amen, right? That's your fault. He, he's talking about getting poisoned for the gospel's sake. Jesse and I have friends. We used to get her to entertain a man uh, by the name of K.D. Bahut. He was an apostle in India. And he came from the highest caste uh, 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 of uh, their lifestyle. It's caste system. It's the way it works. You're born into a caste and you stay there. And I believe his caste, don't quote me, I believe they were called Brahmins. And he was also a religious leader and led the Hindu people. Jesus appeared to him. In a vision, said, I'm Jesus, I'm what you're looking for. He was seeking truth. Jesus appeared. And uh, I pray that that kind of thing would multiply around the world. Come on, somebody. How many of y'all want to see that kind of thing happen in Owensboro? I want to see it happen right here. Christ, Christ in visions and dreams. And he got born again, he became a preacher of the gospel. And then his family tried to poison him and kill him for leaving their faith. And he was poisoned multiple times. And they gave him enough poison to kill him multiple times, but, and he got sick, but he didn't die because in my name you'll cast out devils. In my name you'll speak with new tongues. In my name, if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. They kept trying to kill KD, but they couldn't get it done. Why? Because he came in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap for the name of Jesus. It's a name unlike any other name. It's a name by which every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. See, he goes on and he says, all these things will happen in my name. Come on, somebody say in my name. Let's say it one more time, in my name. Let's say it one more time, in my name. See, the name of Jesus is the PowerPoint. Now, I don't want you to think that the name of Jesus is like a, a, a magic rabbit foot. It's not a magic eight ball. It's not some little statue somebody prayed for and put in your house. The name of Jesus is something you are in, all right? Let, let, me, let me ask you this question. How many of you have called on the name of Jesus and you believe he's the Messiah? You've repented of your sins. You've called on his name. All right, if you've done that, you are now in his name, right? You are in his name. Why? Because the Bible teaches that you that have called on the name of the Lord, you are now the body of Christ. We're all a part of the body of Christ, right? Right now I'm being a mouth for the body of Christ, Jesse will tell you at other times I've been a, 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 I've been a different part of the body, right? You'd say that, honey, at times in my life. But uh, we're all a part of the body of Christ. So if you're a part of the body of Christ, you are now in him. And whenever you show up and you're a part of the body of Christ, and you're on mission, bringing Jesus to the world, representing Christ, showing up and, and, and living a Christian example, whenever you show up, you don't show up in your name anymore. You show up in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So when I show up, I don't show up in my power. Come on, I don't show up in my authority. I don't show up in, in, in what, God's, what, what I am. I show up in his power. I show up in his authority. I show up in everything he's given me. When I show up, I believe this, in the name of Jesus, heaven shows up on my behalf. And when you get that revelation, everything changes. It's why the born-again believers should keep their head up, shoulders back. Come on, somebody. Should walk in like you are somebody, not in arrogance, but somebody who knows you're the child of a king, and now you've showed up in the name of Jesus. Right? There's no other name like it. The Bible teaches in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. See, every knee will bow at one point to Jesus. You can bow today by your will, or you'll bow in the judgment under the forceful judgment of God. But every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess and say, He is Lord. There's that kind of power packing in His name. It is the name of Jesus. So you got to see yourself now, Christian, as in the name of Jesus. And whenever you go, He goes. Whenever you speak, He speaks. Whenever you act, He acts. He is backing your play. 
So now when we show up, supernatural things happen on our behalf because we come in the name of Jesus. I remember years ago, we, we came and uh, Jesse and I, we came to Owensboro in the name of Jesus almost 15 years ago. We're going to Amarillo. We do that now. We do it in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen? We're getting ready to plant a church in Henderson as a, as a church body, uh, a campus in Henderson. We're going to do that in the name of Jesus. Uh, well, we've been around the world, different places, preaching the gospel. Always going in the name of Jesus. People will ask me from time to time, aren't you scared going to those kind of places? Doesn't it make you nervous? No, it really doesn't scare me. It really doesn't make me nervous. Why? Because when I go, I go in the name of Jesus. And I'm not there in my own authority. I'm there in his authority. And that's just the way it is. So I don't fear what the world can do to me anymore. I don't fear any of that. When I show up, God shows up. And uh, it's just the way it is. And I think about Pastor Rand sitting back here, pastored in Pakistan, nine years. He went in the name of Jesus. Went to Vietnam, went in the name of Jesus. Preached all over Russia in the name of Jesus. Went to some of the uh, China, preached in the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you, he's sitting here right now. Whole God protected him and helped him. Come on, give God a hand clap for people that will go in Jesus' name. Amen. I think about years ago, uh, we're starting the church. We came here. And uh, we, got the, we got the building down at 2nd and Allen. It's the Mellow Mushroom now. And it's cool down there now because there's been hundreds of millions invested in the riverfront. But how, how many of y'all remember when the riverfront of Owensboro was, it was nasty down there. Y'all remember? I remember when we first went down there, you get out of the car at night and it kind of felt like this. Jesse, I want you to lay down some cover fire. I'm going for the church door, right? And uh, kind of had that feel down there at night years ago with the bars and everything. Because it was the center where all the derelict bars were. And uh, I know many of you, I remember seeing y'all come out of those bars back in those days, but I'm not going to out you up here, all right? Your secret's safe with me. But I will be receiving an offering that will help me stay quieter right after this service, all right? That's all I got to say. But I remember being down there, and the bars would come, and the bars would go. And uh, we had that, that, that building. There was a bar down there got busted, got in some legal trouble, and we took it, and we renovated that, that building, made it a church. And I took Jesse down there the first time. She's like, you got to be kidding me, but... But then she put her touch on it, made it awesome. And, and how many of y'all were around at Second and Allen? Let me see your, see your hands out there. Very, very cool. I, I love you guys. Thank you for putting up with me for all of these years. Uh, I just heard the story the other day. Sunshine came to the church. I think you came to the church because somebody told you and Jerry that I was playing in nine ball tournaments at Hutch's back in the day, right? She thought it was cool because I played nine ball tournaments. <laughs> Apparently you hadn't met a lot of those guys that play in nine ball tournaments, right? Huh? Preacher play, yeah, I appreciate it. If a preacher plays in the pool, he must be a cool preacher, so I was going to check him out. And uh, I'd go down there, and I would play pool back then, and, and I remember the smoke was so thick in there. I'd pay for it for like two days. And uh, uh, so I played, I, I used to, if you know how to shoot nine ball or play bank pool, you have a very misspent youth is all I got to say, and I'm praying for you. But I was one of those guys, and we were downtown. We renovated that building. People started coming, they started getting uh, born again, and we got an idea down there, I don't remember whose idea it was now, but we got an idea that we were going to start uh, giving safe, free rides home from the bars. If you'd had too much to drink on Friday or Saturday nights, we would send somebody to come and get you and we'll get you home alive. And I remember some nights we, we did, there were some nights we did as many as 60 safe rides home, keeping people alive, keeping them from killing themselves or somebody else. Because, I mean, if you're going to call a cab in Owensboro, there's like one cab in Owensboro, Kentucky, right? You, you, go, you better start thumbing if you need a ride home, right? And uh, we would get people, and we'd pick these, these drunks up, keep them from killing themselves. I remember there were several times I wanted to personally kill them on the way home. I thought, I'll kill these people. Nobody will ever know the way they're acting back there. But, but we would take these people home. And one night, I remember I was with another guy, and we picked up a couple. From the bar, we asked them, where are we going to take you to? They called for a safe ride home, and we got the address, and we started headed towards this place. And there was a lady and her boyfriend, and so the guy driving was sitting up front with the lady, and I was in the back by the boyfriend. And the lady found out that I was the pastor of, of this church. And so she turned around, and she started asking me some spiritual questions. And she was asking me about heaven and hell. And um, she'd had a, a family member that had committed suicide just a couple of days before then. And so she had all these questions about afterlife and about, about uh, death and heaven and hell. She starts asking me these questions, so I start giving her biblical answers, right? 
because I'm just telling her the truth and I'm preaching the gospel to her and trying to love this lady and help her, lead her to Jesus here because she was hurting. And I look over at her boyfriend and her boyfriend was one of these guys that, now you should never underestimate a person, right? Because anybody can be dangerous. How many of y'all have ever seen somebody you didn't think was dangerous just beat the brakes off someone in high school or something like that, right? But then how many know there are some people you can sense that they're bad news? This is a dangerous person, right? God gives you that ability for a reason. And a lot of times we coach that out of people. We'll tell them things like, you got to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I'm like, do you? Do you really have to give them the benefit of the doubt? Maybe God gave you that instinct to protect you, your family, and your children. Maybe it's God-given. And so I'm looking at this guy, and, uh, and I'm talking to the girl, and she asked me about heaven and hell. And so I'm talking to her about heaven and hell. And he looks over at me, and he says, I'm going to send you to heaven or hell. And I turn around, and I say, excuse me? He said, I'm going to send you to heaven or hell. And I said, well, I'm going to heaven, but I'm not going tonight. And I looked over at him. And he's the kind of guy I knew he had at least a knife, maybe a piece on him. What he didn't know about me is I had at least a knife, maybe a piece on me too, right? Because I'm from Western Kentucky, and I'm just kidding. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I am. You'll never know, right? And uh, so we're, we're, we're riding there together, and, and I'm like, I'm going to heaven, but I'm not, I'm not going tonight. And he became so angry. And that spirit that ruled his life began to manifest. He starts cussing, going off. But it was almost like this guy wanted to attack me, but he couldn't at the time. It's almost like there was something that was holding him back. He's wanting to do something to me, but he didn't have the power. He didn't have the, the ability to step across that car and to do something to me. We, we took him to the house that he was going to. He jumped out of the house, ran into the house, and attacked that lady's son that was about 19 years of age, beat him up, and sent him out into the yard. Wow, wow. He, he couldn't do it to me because I came at that point. In what, church? In the name of Jesus. And that kid in the house wasn't in the name of Jesus. That boy was 19. I pray that boy's 35. I pray that boy got even with that jerk at some point. That's my prayer for that kid. Because that might bring him to repentance. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Huh? But now I'm not saying it always works that way. Because I know there's people that have been beaten for preaching the gospel. There's martyrs all over the world. And come on, we honor them. I'm thankful for the people that have given massive sacrifice physically, mentally, emotionally, even their life for the preaching of the gospel. Can we give all those people a hand clap that lay their life all over the world, lay their life down on the line? Man, for the message of Jesus. Powerful people. I know they can't hear us right now. Maybe it does something in the spirit whenever we celebrate and honor them, right? Powerful people. All over the world. They go in the name of Jesus. But that night I was operating in divine protection. Why? Because I was there in Jesus' name. See, that's when the stuff starts happening for you. When you'll take your life seated in Jesus' name and make your life more about Jesus' purposes than it is about your purpose. He went on and he said this. He says this in the Gospel of John. Whatever you ask in my name, everybody say in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, everybody say in my name. I will do it. Well, to ask something in the name of Jesus, you have to be in the body of Christ. And if you're in the body of Christ, you're lined up with the will of Christ. Can I get an amen? And you have his purpose as the front of your thought, your heart, your imagination, your will. And Jesus' uh, uh, want for our life is for us to get so wrapped up in him, so wrapped up in his name, that what we do, what we ask for, what we pray for, where we go, and our purpose in our life is really his purpose in life. I love that. I love, when we I do love that. I'm telling you, protection starts flowing. We do that, provision starts flowing. When you do that, man, the grace of God starts flowing in your life in a new way. As long as you're just existing, a lot of these things will never come to pass in your life. But when you get in the name of Jesus and begin to function in that name, I'm telling you, all things are possible for him who believes. Come on, if you believe it, why don't you give the Lord a hand clap? Stand up on your feet. I'm out of time. I want to get to pray for you this morning.
If everybody just stay with me for one more moment. Stay with me one more moment. I want to pray that a revelation of the name of Jesus will be released into this church. A revelation of the name of Jesus, that it would be released into this church. You might just bow your head, close your eyes. If you're comfortable with it, you might want to lift a hand to heaven. Now, I'm going to pray that that revelation will come to all of us afresh and anew. Father, I thank you for the revelation of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we lift up hands right now to that name, a name above every other name. I thank you that through that name we're saved. Through that name we're healed. Through that name we're delivered. Lord, I thank you that every knee bows right now to the name of Jesus. I speak to cancer and I command it to bow to the name of Jesus. Diabetes, I thank you that it bows to the name of Jesus. Depression, I say you bow to the name of Jesus. Addiction, you bow to the name of Jesus. Every knee bows. Now, Lord, I thank you that you would give us a revelation of your name and who we are in you. I bless these people. I thank you that wherever they go, that power flows, that help from heaven is with them. Lord, if they're Christians, I thank you when they show up in your name, you back their play. I declare you're back in our play. Take the gospel around the world and bring the goodness of God to people. I pray all of these things for my friends and my family this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's give God one more hand clap this morning.